In this one hour English lesson, you are going to learn lots of advanced English grammar and vocabulary and sentence structure, but you're going to do it by completing tests. So you're going to complete different tests throughout this lesson to test your knowledge and then improve your knowledge at the same time. Because this is a long lesson, what I've done is I've divided it into five short sections. So you'll complete one section, you'll test your knowledge, you'll learn lots, and then you can move on to the next session. And you can come back and complete these tests and review the lesson and materials anytime. Welcome back to J4S English Training. Of course, I'm Jennifer, and this is your place to become a fluent, confident English speaker. Now let's get started. Here's how the test is going to work. You're going to see a question and you'll see four options. You have to decide which option best completes the sentence. I'll show the question for only five seconds, which isn't a long time, so feel free to hit pause, complete the question, and then hit play and I'll explain the answer. Are you ready? All right, let's get started with question one. Mm to text Sue. It's her birthday today. The correct answer is C. Don't forget to text Sue. It's her birthday today. The key word in this question is to, which is the infinitive to text. Now there's only one possible option in the choices below where you can have the infinitive and that's C. Don't forget to text. Now, if this question didn't have two and it was just the base verb, well, then A, B, and D would be correct and C would be incorrect. Question two. Mary went jogging today mm, of the rain. The correct answer is B, in spite of of the rain. And that's your keyword here, of. In spite of and despite have the same meaning, but you don't say despite of, you just say despite. If you want to learn more about this, I have a full lesson explaining this. I'll leave the link in the description below. Question three, I think I'm allergic to your cat. I can't stop. The correct answer is B, sneezing. Now this is a tricky one because you can have grammatically stop plus infinitive, stop to sneeze, and you can have stop plus gerund, stop sneezing. But the meaning is different. When we're talking about no longer doing an action, we use stop plus gerund. And based on the context of the question, we're talking about no longer doing an action, so we need the gerund. If you want to learn more about this, I'll leave a link in the description below. Question four. If you don't know the meaning of a word, you can mm in a dictionary. And the answer is C. You can look it up in the dictionary. Now this one is a vocabulary question because you need to understand what these expressions mean. To look something up is another way to say to search for or to find that specific information. Now we use this all the time because every time you Google, you're looking up information. So I use this expression literally every single day. Hey, what time does the restaurant close? Can you look it up? I don't know. Can you look it up? Oh, we need to look it up. We should look that up. You'll use this every single day. Question five. My doctor, mm, me, I should exercise more. And the answer is A. My doctor told me 
I should exercise more. Now this is one that students confuse a lot. I hear students say told to me, I told to her. No, that doesn't work grammatically. We don't want to someone. Get rid of that too. I told her, I told you, she told me. So that's what we need. And also I hear students say, say me. She said me to exercise more. No, we don't want me after said. She said I should exercise more. We want a clause after said. If you want to learn more about this, I have a full video explaining it. You can find the link in the description below. Question six, my boss mm, me to her dinner party. And the answer is, B, my boss invited me to her dinner party. Now this one is both a vocabulary question because the only logical choice is invite, but it's also because of sentence structure. We could change the sentence structure and make it work. For example, my boss suggested that I come to her dinner party. We could say that, but I'd have to completely change the sentence structure. So all the options could work if we change the sentence structure. The only logical choice with the sentence structure is B. My boss invited me because you invite someone to something. My boss invited me to the movies, to her house, to the restaurant a specific location. Now, if you want to learn more about suggested, because a lot of students say suggested me, which isn't correct, I'll leave a link to a video on that topic in the description below. Question seven. Sorry, I didn't quite mm, what you said. And the answer is A. Sorry, I didn't quite catch what you said. This is an expression. To catch something in this context is the exact same as here. I didn't hear what you said. But notice option D is in the past form and that doesn't work grammatically. So it has the same meaning, but it's the wrong verb tense. So A, catch is exactly the same. Now this is an expression you can use all the time, especially since you probably struggle to understand native speakers. So if somebody says something to you and you don't quite catch it, you can say, sorry, I didn't catch that. I didn't catch that. I didn't quite catch that. Quite is just a word we add to mean mm, a little bit. I didn't quite catch that. So add that to your vocabulary. You'll use it all the time. Question eight, I don't sleep in now, but I mm, sleep in until noon on weekends. And the answer is B, I used to. I used to sleep in on weekends. Now notice all the options are slightly different sentence structures and they're all grammatically correct if you use the correct meaning. But for here, we're talking about an action that used to take place in the past. So an action you routinely did in the past, but you no longer do now. And for that, we need use with a D. You don't hear it in pronunciation, but it's there in spelling. I used to work at the bank, but now I work at the mall. <laughs> so a routine action in the past, but you no longer do it now. Students confuse this sentence structure all the time. I have a detailed lesson on this. You'll find the link in the description below. Question nine, I don't need help, but thanks. Mm. And the answer is, but thanks for offering. Thanks for offering. 
Thanks for offering. This is one that I hear a lot of mistakes with as well. Now notice here, I have thanks for. After for, because for is a preposition, you must use the gerund verb, for offering. Thanks for, and then you can use a gerund verb, or you can use a noun. Thanks for your help. Thanks for the offer, your offer. Thanks for offering. And your final question, number 10. The film sounded interesting, but it, mm, to be really boring. And the answer is D. It turned out to be really boring. This is a vocabulary question because you need to understand what these expressions mean. We use to turn out when we're talking about the end result of something. So let's say you're trying a new recipe and it's for chocolate chip cookies. You've never made this recipe before. Your friend could say, how did the recipe turn out. How did the cookies turn out? Your friend is asking about the end result. Basically, your friend is asking, were they good? Were they bad? How did the recipe turn out? And you could reply, oh, it was awesome. They were delicious. The best chocolate chip cookies I've ever had. And in this context, they're talking about the movie's end result. How did the movie turn out? Uh, it was really boring. It turned out to be really boring. So how did you do with the quiz? Put your score in the comments below. And if you learn some new expressions or new sentence structure, make sure you practice your new expressions or sentence structure in the comments below as well so you get really comfortable and confident with them. So here's how the test will work. I'll show you the question and you'll see the multiple options. Now I'll only show it for a few seconds. So hit pause, take as much time as you need. And when you're ready for the answer, hit play. I'll share the answer and I'll also explain why that answer is correct. Are you ready? Let's get started with question number one. There are about 20 so people waiting in the office. And the answer is, or so. There are about 20 or so people waiting in the office. Now this is just an expression. We use or so to mean approximately, around. There are around 20 people, approximately 20 people. But notice the word order. There are 20 or so people compared to there are approximately 20 people. So the sentence structure is a little bit different, but this is a great casual expression to have in your vocabulary. I have 10 or so emails to reply to. I have approximately 10 emails to reply to. Question two, there was a problem with the cell phone, but I, it now. but I have fixed it now. I fixed it now. We need the present perfect verb tense because we're talking about a past action that's complete. The cell phone is fixed right now. So the action is complete, but there is a result in the present. We know that because of the keyword now, but I've fixed it now, now. When we're talking about a past action with a result in the present, the best choice is the present perfect. If you want to learn more about the past simple and the present perfect, I made a video on this. You'll find the link in the description below. Question three, I think going to the coast this weekend be a good idea. And the answer is, would be a good idea. 
Would is the best choice because we're talking about a hypothetical. It would be a good idea to go to the coast. If you change the word order, you can see that it would be awkward and unnatural to say it should be. It should be a good idea to go to the coast. We use should with recommendations or advice. You should go to the coast this weekend. I'm recommending that to you. I'm advising you. But when we're just talking about a hypothetical, would is the best choice. Question four. The thing, once a film gets a bad review, it's hard for it to do well. The thing is, the thing is, this is an expression we use in English. We use it before we introduce an idea. The thing is, I don't think you should go to the coast this weekend. So it's just an expression that we use and based on the options, is is the only possible choice to complete this expression. Question five. I, some old drawings when I was cleaning out my closet. I came across. I came across some old drawings. The phrasal verb to come across something is used when you find something accidentally. I wasn't looking for the drawings. I found them accidentally. Oh wow, look at these drawings. I haven't seen them in years. I had no idea they were here. Based on the context, the only expression that makes sense is came across. Number six, she managed to play tennis despite a sore arm. And the answer is despite having a sore arm. After despite, you need a gerund verb because despite is a preposition. Despite having a sore arm. Number seven, longer do we need to file that form? And the answer is no longer. No longer do we need to file that form. This is an alternative structure to saying we don't need to file that form any longer. If you use the expression we don't need to, you need the choice any longer because we don't use double negatives in English. So you couldn't say we don't need to file that form no longer. That doesn't work. But if we're starting with no longer do we need, because do we need is a positive, you're making it negative with the choice no. This is simply an alternative sentence structure. To be honest, the more popular or common sentence structure is we don't need to file that form any longer. Number eight, they are to have arrived already. And the answer is they are supposed to have arrived already. The expression is to be supposed to. They are supposed to have arrived already. Based on the sentence structure, the only possible choice is supposed to. A lot of students make mistakes with the expression supposed to. I made a lesson on this topic. I'll leave the link in the description below. Number nine, by the time they, at the concert, the tickets were already sold out. And the answer is, by the time they turned up at the concert. When a person turns up at or to a location, it means they arrive at that location. So if you're at a party, you could ask someone, when's Julie supposed to turn up? when she's supposed to arrive. It's simply a phrasal verb, and based on the options, this is the only expression that makes sense. Number 10, I was able to get to the top of the mountain. And the answer is, unfit as I am, 
This is a useful way to describe yourself or to describe a situation. Beautiful as it was, I didn't take a picture. Smart as he is, he didn't pass the test. Number 11, I'm 100% certain that everything okay in the end. And the answer is, I'm 100% certain that everything will be okay in the end. We use the future simple, will be, when we're making predictions about the future. Now, even though I say 100% certain, it's still making a prediction because I don't control the future. The outcome of the future is still unknown and I'm making a prediction of the future. Number 12, as a cab driver, I, but I'd love a bigger paycheck. And the answer is, I get by, I get by, but I love a bigger paycheck. By putting in paycheck, I know we're talking about money and the expression get by in terms of finances, we use that when you're just able to pay for everything you need, but you don't have very much left over. I get by, I get by. Question 13, I don't want to spend the weekend with her. And the answer is, much as, much as I enjoy her company. This is an expression and it's the only grammatically correct choice and the best choice based on the options. Much as I enjoy her company. Now notice, much as I enjoy her company, that's a positive, but then the next part of the sentence is a negative. I don't want to spend the weekend with her. So this is a great transition sentence that you can use. Much as I enjoy studying English, I don't want to spend my whole weekend doing it. Number 14, the fact of the is our company has to increase its revenue. And the answer is, the fact of the matter is, this is an expression, the fact of the matter. Based on the options, this is the best word choice to complete this expression. The fact of the matter is, and then you state your clause. The fact of the matter is, I need to improve my English. And finally, question 15, the company has doubled its revenue it still has a lot of problems to overcome. And the answer is, however, it still has a lot of problems to overcome. All of these options are transition words. The only transition word that's used for a contrast is however. And notice this is a contrast because idea one, the company has doubled its revenue, that's positive. But then idea two, there are still problems to overcome, well that's negative, right? So we're dealing with a contrasting situation. However, if you want to learn more about transition words, you can look in the description for a link I have on a separate video. So how'd you do on this advanced vocabulary test? Make sure you share your score in the comments below. And if you got any wrong, just do some practice so you feel more comfortable with them. Are you ready to see if you know these 15 confusing English words? So here's how this video is going to work. I'm going to show you a sentence and you're going to have two options and you have to decide which option correctly completes the sentence. Now I'll only show the sentence for a couple seconds. So make sure you hit pause, take your time to read it, to answer it, and then hit play and I'll show you the answer and I'll explain why that answer is correct. Are you ready to go? Number one, there were people at the party than I had expected. 
The answer is fewer. There were fewer people at the party than I had expected. And the reason is we use fewer with countable nouns. You can count how many people there are, but we use less with uncountable nouns. So I could say there was less rain. You can't count rain. There was less rain this year compared to last year. Number two, I'm just in the of a big project. And the answer is midst, midst. This is a tricky one simply because of pronunciation. When you hear this in spoken English, I'm in the midst of a big project. It's easy to confuse this with missed. And to be in the midst of something is simply to be in the middle of something. So I'm in the middle of a big project. Number three, Wow, that shirt really, your hair. And the answer is compliments with an E. These two words sound exactly the same in pronunciation. It's spelling that is different, but they have different meanings. Compliment in this example is when one thing, your shirt, combines really well with another thing, your hair. Compliment with an I is when you say something nice to someone. I love your shirt. Thanks for the compliment. If you want to learn more about compliment and compliment, you can look in the description for a link on a video on that topic. Number four, that movie had quite an on me? The answer is effect. It had quite an effect on me. The pronunciation is very similar. Effect, effect. There's a slight difference, but the spelling is important because effect is a verb and effect is a noun. And we need a noun. You know that because there's an article in the sentence. With the verb, I could say that movie affected me. If you want to learn more about effect and effect, you can look in the description for a link on that. Number five, quizzes are a great way to your skills. To hone your skills. Again, similar in pronunciation, but the correct choice is hone. This is an expression to hone one skills. This is simply to improve one's skills. Number six, I didn't know at the party. I didn't know anybody at the party. Didn't is negative. In the English language, we do not like double negatives. You can only use one negative in a clause. And since I already have didn't, I can't use the negative nobody. I have to use anybody. Number seven, I don't like carrots. I don't like carrots either. Now, this is the same as number six because I don't, don't is a negative. Neither is also a negative, so we can't use it. We want either. I don't like carrots either. To use neither, I could say, you don't like carrots? Neither do I, neither do I. If you want to learn more about either and neither, you can look in the description for a video I created on this. And number eight, she has more she needs. She has more than she needs. Similar in pronunciation, than, then, but they're two totally different words. Than we use in comparisons, more than, less than, fewer than, comparisons. Then is an adverb, it's used in time references. First I'll eat lunch, then I'll go for a walk. Number nine, 
Joining social clubs is, for all purposes, the solution to loneliness. For all intents and purposes. This is an expression in English, for all intents and purposes. This simply means in almost every situation, in virtually every situation. But when you say this at a natural pace, for all intents and purposes, for all intents and purposes, it sounds like intensive. Intensive is a word that people are very familiar with. Intense and is not something that people are familiar with, but the correct expression is intense and purposes. This is a very useful business or academic expression. It isn't really used in casual conversation too much. Number 10, we can discuss this after the meeting. We can discuss this further after the meeting. Further and farther both mean more. We can discuss this more in more detail after the meeting. We use further when we're talking about figurative and we use farther when we're talking about literal. For example, we need to walk farther. We literally need to walk more. We need to walk farther to see the waterfall. If you want to learn more about this, look in the description for a link on a separate video. Number 11, you can down here. You can lie down here. Lay and lie, they have the same meaning, but lay is transitive. It needs an object. For example, lay the baby down here. Lay the blanket down here. You lay something. But lie is intransitive, so there's no object. Lie down here. Lie yourself down here. Lie down here. Number 12, that sweater is too for you. That sweater is too loose for you. This one is confusing because of the spelling. Do I need one O or two? It's easy to forget. Lose with one O is the opposite of win. Did you lose the game? Did you win the game? Did you lose the game? Loose with two O's when we're talking about clothing is when it doesn't fit closely to your body. So this shirt I'm wearing is not loose. It fits closely to my body. But this sweater, for example, is loose. Number 13, we should worked harder. We should have worked harder. Now this is a mistake that many native speakers make because in spoken English, we take have, which is the grammatically correct choice, but we reduce it. We say it quickly and it sounds like of, you should have, you should have, you should have worked harder. So sometimes native speakers forget that it's actually have and not of, because that's what it sounds like in spoken English. So in spoken English, you can absolutely say you should have, you should have worked harder. But in written English, just remember that the correct choice is have. Number 14, I shouldn't have to the party. I shouldn't have gone to the party. Our verb here is go. The past simple is went, and the past participle is gone. This structure requires the past participle, the third form of the verb. Yesterday I went to the party. I've gone to three parties this month. And finally, number 15, do you trust the most? Whom do you trust the most? Who and whom, it can be very tricky for students and native speakers to know the difference. Just ask yourself, do you need she or her? Do you need a subject or an object? She or her, he 
or him. I trust her the most. We need an object, not a subject, so you use whom. Who is your friend? She is my friend. In this case, we need a subject, so we use who. So how'd you do with this quiz? Share your score in the comments below. So here's how this lesson will work. I'll show you a question and there'll be a blank and you have to decide which option, which verb tense best completes the sentence. Now I'll only show the question for a few seconds. So hit pause, take as much time as you need. And when you're ready, hit play and I'll share the correct answer and I'll explain why that answer is correct. Are you ready? Let's get started. Question one, my flight at 9 a.m. tomorrow. And the answer is, my flight leaves at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Now both B and C are future verbs. And we need a future verb because we have the keyword tomorrow. So I know we're in the future but we use the present simple in the future on one specific occasion, and that's with timetable events, with scheduled events. So transportation runs on a schedule. You get a ticket and it tells you the time. We can consider that a scheduled event. If you're going to a party, a wedding, a meeting in the future, and there's a scheduled event, you can simply say, my meeting starts at two o'clock next Tuesday. Question two, she, two books so far this year. And the answer is, she has written two books so far this year. Your keyword here is this year. This year is still in progress. If it were complete, I'd say last year. She's written two books so far this year. So which verb tense am I using? The present perfect has written. We use the present perfect for actions that started in the past but are still in progress. So the books she has written, those are complete. Those two books are sitting on her shelf, but it's possible for her to write more books because the year is still in progress, the present perfect. Number three, your eyes are red and puffy. And the answer is, have you been crying? Have you been crying? The verb tense here is the present perfect continuous. We need a continuous verb in this context because the focus is on the action. The focus is not on the result. The focus is on the action of crying. I want to emphasize the action crying. Have you cried? The present perfect? That sounds awkward because there's no focus on the action. Question four, if I, you, I'd quit. And the answer is, if I were you, if I were you. Now having I and were side by side may sound unnatural to you because the past form of the verb to be with the subject I is was, of course, right? I was tired. I was angry. You were tired. You were angry. She was tired. They were tired. But this isn't in the past simple. This is in the subjunctive. And the conjugation for the subjunctive verb is were for all subjects. I, you, he, she, it, we, they, were. 
Now, why does this question need the subjunctive? Because it's hypothetical. I'm not you. That's a hypothetical situation. If I were you, but I'm not you, I'm me, <laughs> right? If I were younger, if I were older, if I were taller, if I were shorter, those are all hypothetical situations. Number five, Dave. At the bank since 2009. And the answer is, Dave has been working at the bank since 2009. Now, we're using the present perfect continuous because the action started in the past and continues until now. When did Dave start working at the bank? Dave started working at the bank in 2009. Where does Dave work now, today? At the bank, right? So action that started in the past and continues until now. Question six, Carmen has a hair appointment tomorrow. Carmen, her hair cut tomorrow. And the answer is, Carmen is getting her hair cut tomorrow. Now, the first sentence is just to provide context so you know there's a scheduled event. And that's important because we use the present continuous, not the future simple. We use the present continuous when we're talking about a scheduled event in the future. Let's say I have a plane ticket to go to Australia in five years. Even though it's five years, a long time away, it's still a scheduled event. So I would say I'm going, present continuous, I'm going to Australia in five years because it's a scheduled event. Question seven, Samuel to Paris at least five times. And the answer is, Samuel has gone to Paris at least five times. Now, there's no indication of time in this example. There's no past reference, last year, last month, and there's no future reference either. So I know we're just talking about in general. And we use the present perfect, has gone, we use the present perfect to talk about life experience, the things we have done or haven't done in our life. And the reason is because our life is unfinished. Our life is in progress. It started in the past and it continues until now. So while we're alive and still living, we use the present perfect to talk about our life experience. Question eight, I think Sarah, a promotion next year. And the answer is, I think Sarah will get a promotion next year. So my keyword here is next year, so I know I'm in the future. And notice the other keyword, I think, I think. We use the future simple to make predictions about the future. I think, Sarah. I don't know this 100%. It's a prediction. I think Sarah will get a promotion next year. Number nine, the client by the time I checked my messages. The client had called by the time I checked my messages. This is the past perfect. The past perfect is used to talk about a past action, a completed past action that takes place before another past action. So on our timeline, we have two past events. The client called, I checked my messages. Now we use the past perfect 
for the first past action, which is the older action. And we use the past simple for the second past action, which is the newer action on our timeline. The client had called by the time I checked my messages. And finally, question 10, I can't believe they, their baby by the time we get there. And the answer is, I can't believe they will have had their baby by the time we get there. Which verb tense is this? The future perfect. We don't use the future perfect too often, but it's still an important verb tense. We use the future perfect to talk about a completed action in the future. So let's say right now it's summer 2022 and the baby is due in the fall 2022. So right now in summer, it's a future action, right? But let's say I'm traveling to visit this couple in the winter of 2022. So I'm going to take my timeline from now and I'm going to change the timeline to winter 2022. And by winter 2022, the baby will have been born. So that action, although it's a future action now, when I change the timeline to winter 2022, the action will actually be in the past. So did you know all of these verb tenses? Make sure you share your score in the comments below and do some example sentences practicing the verb tenses that you found most difficult. Maybe that future perfect? So you can do that in the comments below. Are you ready to add the top 10 phrasal verbs to your vocabulary? Now make sure you watch right until the end because I'm going to quiz you to see how well you know how to use these phrasal verbs. Phrasal verb number one to add up. We use this phrasal verb to say that something seems reasonable or likely. And the something is usually a story, an explanation, or a reason. So let's say your coworker took a week off of work because she had to care for her sick mother. But then she comes back to the office a week later and she's really tanned and it's winter. You might say, Something doesn't add up. Her story doesn't seem reasonable or likely. Something doesn't add up. If she was taking care of her sick mother, why does she have a tan? I bet she took the week off to go to the beach, to go on vacation, to beat down. This is a very simple but useful phrasal verb. We use this phrasal verb only with the sun when the sun is shining very strongly. So if you're sitting on a patio and it's sunny outside and it's really, really hot, you can say, wow, it's really beating down it being the sun. If you say it, you don't have to define the subject, the noun, as the sun because we always use this phrasal verb with the sun, so it's not necessary. And the context of sitting on a patio on a sunny day is all you need. So it's really beating down. Now, you can use an object and say us, it's really beating down on us. Notice I have to add an extra preposition, on. Beat down on someone or something. You can use a something. You might say, you should move your laptop. The sun is really beating down on it, on your laptop. And that's not very good for your electronics, right? So you should put your laptop in the shade. Number three, to tidy up. 
This is when you organize or arrange things in the right place. So you can take a bedroom, an office, a kitchen, any individual room, or you could take an entire house even, and you might say, this weekend I need to tidy up, or this weekend I need to tidy my office up. So you're going to go in your office and you're going to put all the things, the objects in the right place. So this is a very useful phrasal verb. Number four, to talk down to. When you talk down to someone, you talk to them in a way that makes them feel less intelligent than you or less important than you. So this is a negative phrasal verb. This often happens with adults and children adults and teenagers, parents and teenagers. A teenager might complain or a young adult might complain that their parents always talk down to them. They talk to them in a way that makes them feel less intelligent or less important. This often happens in the workplace, especially with someone in a higher position and someone in a lower position, that someone in a higher position might talk down to that person, even though that person has a lot more experience than them. And there's no reason to do that. So this is used in a negative way, but it commonly happens. So you'll hear this phrasal verb a lot when people are complaining about other people. Number five, to sum up. This means to summarize the main points. We commonly use this phrasal verb when you're ending a presentation or a speech in your conclusion when you want to summarize. So at the end of your presentation, you might say to sum up, if we want to increase our profits, we need to diversify our product line. So that's the main point of your presentation. You elaborated on that main point, and now you're saying to sum up, to summarize. So this is an excellent phrasal verb to add to your business vocabulary to sound very advanced, professional, and natural. Number six, to joke around. When you joke around, it means what you're saying shouldn't be taken seriously. You're just joking. You're just being lighthearted. You're just having fun. But we commonly use this to reassure someone. So you might say, oh, don't get mad. I was just joking around. So maybe you were making comments about someone in a lighthearted way, but they took it seriously. And you reassure them, don't get mad, I was just joking around. Now sometimes you might tell someone, you shouldn't joke around about job loss. So maybe somebody is making comments about other people losing their jobs, and they're not taking it very seriously. But you want that person to know that's inappropriate. That's a serious topic. You shouldn't joke around about job loss. It's affected many people. Number seven, to eat out. This simply means to eat in a restaurant. So rather than saying, last night I went to a restaurant for dinner, we just simply say, last night I ate out. Last night I ate out, which means I ate in a restaurant. This morning, I ate out before work. So because it's morning, obviously we're talking about breakfast. So you can use it for any meal of the day. So you might suggest to your friend, if you want to save money, you should stop eating out. You should stop eating out all the time. So you should stop eating in restaurants because of course it's more expensive. So this is an excellent phrasal verb to add to your daily vocabulary to sound like a native English speaker. Number eight, to drum up. Now when you drum something up, it means you increase support or interest in someone or something. 
So let's say your company introduced a new product, but sales are lower than expected. Your boss might suggest everybody meet to brainstorm ways to drum up interest. So to increase interest, to drum up sales, to increase sales. So if you put drum up before the noun, it just means increase. Let's drum up support increase support, drum up enthusiasm, increase enthusiasm. Number nine, to speak up. When you speak up, it means you speak more loudly. So right now I'm talking at this volume, but maybe you could say, Jennifer, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Can you speak up? Can you increase the volume of your voice? And I'll say, sure, I can speak up, and then I'll speak more loudly. So this is an excellent phrasal verb for a language learner because often you don't understand someone the first time, and part of the problem might be that they're speaking too quietly. So you can say, can you speak up? Can you please speak up? Or do you mind speaking up? and then the other person will speak more loudly. Number 10, to work out a problem or a situation. This means that the problem or situation becomes better, it improves. So let's say you're having a conflict with your boss. Your coworker might say, don't worry, I'm sure you'll work it out, work it out. Out. The it being the situation, the problem, the conflict. I'm sure you'll work it out. I'm sure it will improve. I'm sure it will become better. We also use this with problems in general, not specific to conflicts. So let's say you lost a lot of money in the stock market. That's a problem, but your friend can say, don't worry, I'm sure it will work out. So it being the situation that you lost a lot of money. I'm sure it will all work out in the end. So that is a very common expression that native speakers use to reassure someone that a situation, a problem, a conflict will improve. I'm sure it will all work out in the end. Now you have 10 new phrasal verbs added to your vocabulary to sound fluent, advanced, and natural in English. Awesome job. Are you ready for your quiz? Here are your questions. Hit pause and take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play to see the answers. So how did you do with that quiz? Let's find out. Here are the answers. Hit pause, compare the answers to your own, and whenever you're ready, hit play. All right, so what was your score out of 10? Make sure you share your score in the comments below, and if you got any wrong, don't worry. That just means you're learning, and just keep practicing. Do some example sentences in the comments below, share your score, and do some example sentences with your favorite phrasal verbs from this lesson to help you remember them. Amazing job with this lesson. Think of all the grammar, all the vocabulary, all the sentence structure, everything you learned in this lesson. Now, of course, you need to repeat these concepts, so come back, review this lesson anytime, and practice some of your new grammar and vocabulary and sentence structure in the comments below. And if you found this video helpful, please hit the like button, share it with your friends, and of course, subscribe. And before you go, make sure you head on over to my website, jforestenglish.com, and download your free speaking guide. In this guide, I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. And until next time, have Happy studying.